Let me ask you about one more obstacle in the obstacle course, as you described it uh, earlier, and that's inflation. Mm -hmm. You uh, talk uh, in your uh, assessment uh, about the likelihood that uh, assuming inflation expectations uh, stay well anchored is the phrase that, that you use. Mm -hmm. uh, inflation should gradually wane uh, this year. And I, I was left uncertain as to where you are in what's really been an interesting debate among economists mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. inflation. There's the Larry Summers view for, for shorthand that says we've got a real problem here and that in, in inflation expectations in, in fact are growing uh, in, in the global economy. And then uh, our Fed chairman, Jay Powell, uh, has, has said, no, it's largely transitory. He's modified that a bit. But t t tell us where you are in, in, in your judgment about how fundamental the inflationary pressure is today in the global economy. Uh, inflation is a uh, more significant economic and social problem than we thought it would be some months ago. What is that we learned new that helps us to reassess uh, uh, the uh, role of inflation and then on that basis the necessity to take measures, central banks to step forward, take measures to combat in inflation. First, what we learned is that the interruptions in global supply chains are longer lasting than we initially thought. We were hopeful that they would be uh, brought under control as early as in the first half of this year, of 2022. Now we see that they are likely to continue, both because the waves of COVID are still causing the necessity of some restrictions, uh, but also because other factors contribute to pressures on supplies. Let's take one. We moved quite significantly away from services to goods. What does it mean? much more demand for computers, for, for cars, for um, uh, equipments uh, that are necessary to produce all these goods. And uh, the result is supply just cannot easily catch up. We also were underestimating the uh, climate factor and the pressure it puts on food prices. We have to recognize we are in a more shock-prone uh, world and we, we do need to expect these kinds of shocks to be a factor in the future. And last but not least, we, did, we underestimated somewhat how much delayed consumption, in other words, people getting support through various forms of stimulus and putting it into savings can contribute to a much stronger consumer demand. So we are in a situation in which Indeed, we recognize that it is important not only to rely on inflation expectations being well anchored, but to seek some interventions that would bring inflation under control. Central banks are doing it. They're doing it very carefully in a deliberate manner, communicating their intentions, and the Fed has done a very good job in that regard here in the United States. Uh, in many emerging market economies, steps have been taken even earlier because inflation became a problem of a larger magnitude earlier. Uh, we need to recognize, though, two issues. One, in 22, conditions in different countries are very different. Um, we are talking about fighting inflation in the United States and in Japan, they're fighting to boost inflation because they cannot reach their 2% uh, target. So there is an accordion of the presence of this problem and therefore measures to be applied. And the second uh, point that we need to be very mindful of is that taking action to combat inflation has to be very well calibrated against the objective of supporting the recovery. 
So that balancing act is one that, again, needs to be calibrated in every country. And we need to be very agile, data-driven. What is it that we learn? Because uh, when we think about inflation and increase of interest rate, you know, withdrawal of uh, uh, quantitative easing, raising interest rates, that has spillover impact on access to credit and uh, growth opportunities, the theme we were discussing before. It also has spillover impact on other countries. And there we have to be mindful of the other obstacle on our course, and it is higher level of debt. In 2020, because we needed to support an economy in standstill, both governments and private sector households borrowed more than they usually would. Debt levels in 2020 reached $226 trillion, the largest increase in debt since the Second World, uh, uh, War, World War. Now, we look at that picture, obviously, a good performance of the economy would allow debt levels to gradually go down on average. But for countries under a high level of debt that happen to be slow on the COVID recovery because of low vaccinations, because of limited space, that change in policy, that increase in rates by the Fed, by other central banks, by their own uh, banks, central banks, that can be uh, quite restrictive for their own recovery. Uh, and I want to finish with this picture. In 2015, 30% of low-income countries were in that dis distress or close to it. In 2021, they reached 60%. And obviously, we have to be very mindful of measures that can be taken to prevent in different places debt problems turning into a uh, you know, domestic economic catastrophe. And the fund plays a very important role in that regard.